Welcome to the Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island. Free-flowing talk with a charismatic, down-to-earth host. Join Dean as he interviews and chats freely with his guests, ranging from superstar athletes to politicians, industry titans, and everyday folk with fascinating life stories. Dean educates, entertains, and most of all, touches people's lives. You're listening to The Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island. Hello, everyone, and this is Dean Blackman, host of The Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island. I am very excited about this day. It's the launch of my new radio show. I've been working in business for over 30 years. I've had the opportunity to work and connect with different people from all over the world. This show is completely a new venture for me, but in essence, it's something I've been doing my whole life. I love connecting with people and hearing their experiences. And this is what I will be doing as your host on the Dean Blackman Show. Today, uh, we, we will have my mother, Jean Blackman, is on as the first initial launch of the Dean Blackman Show. Mom, how are you? I'm happy as a lark, Jean. Mom, I'm happy as can be as well. I'm so excited for you. And I wish you well, the best, because you are the best and you deserve the best. Thank you, Mom. Appreciate it. You know, I just want to also say while you're on the line that uh, from Delray Beach, Florida, that uh, our guests also will be from all different industries on the show and all walks of life. And that we'll be delving into various topics such as sports politics, business, entertainment, lifestyle, family, and current affairs. That it will always be our goal at the Dean Blackman Show to educate, entertain, and inspire our listeners. So nothing, nothing was better than on the inaugural show of the Dean Blackman Show to have uh, my mother. And I'm happy to have you, Mom. I'm overwhelmed that you picked me, Jean. My cup runneth over. Uh, I can't believe it, but here it is, and I love it. <laughs> I love it. So what can I? Well, do it's ama you it's ama it's amazing. It's amazing that uh, the other the other day you had a birthday. So happy birthday, Mom! Eighty nine. Th and thank you. 89. And we had a wonderful birthday party here at Harbor's Edge for all the people who were born in July. And it was a very exciting day for me. And I told all, everybody was interviewed. And when it was my turn, I told the people that at 89, I'm starting a new career. <laughs> and they were very excited about it. I said, I'm joining my son's show, and I invite you all to call in and tell him that you know me. So if you get calls from these people, because I think they're all going to listen, you won't be surprised. <laughs> Mom. So that was my birthday. Mom, I'm going to say that I'm going to try to say this only once, but you are a remarkable, remarkable lady. And I've been told, I've been told, as you know, by my sister-in-law, Toby, out in Freehold, New Jersey, that if, uh, if I continue to use remarkable a lot, that she'll start having a drink every time that I say remarkable about you, Mom. <laughs> I decided if I become a household word, Dean, maybe I'll run for president. Mom, incre incredible. And that's another word. But I always want you to know that you're welcome on my show anytime as a guest, a co-host. And you can be sure while I have uh, guests on the show, I'm going to be calling you up uh, randomly to come on. I love you and wonderful, but I also want you guests to know that I am so lucky because I have four other sons just like you and just as wonderful. We're going to we're going to get into that story, but first I see trying to get in on the show, we're going to go across to the Atlantic Ocean right now 
and someone very special to me and part of this show, the exclusive European correspondent for the Dean Blackman show, Ria Bo. She's over in the UK, 50 miles from London. She'll tell everybody exactly what town and where she's at and how, uh, how everything evolved with uh, coming together with Dean and the show. And she wants to say hi to you, Mom. Hello, Ria. Hello, Dean. Hello, Mrs. Blackman. And happy birthday, Mrs. Blackman. Hi, Ria. Hi, darling. I hope you're doing well. It's fabulous to have you on the show. Uh, just to give you a bit about myself, I'm based around 80 kilometres northwest of London. And I'll be bringing various different segments to you from the news to Ria's ditties. I have a question time, the less question it segment. And I have a Scrabble word for you, Mrs. Blackman, that you may find interesting, but probably already know. Back to you, Dean. Ria, speaking of Scrabble, you know, we did some pilot tests uh, with my mom last week uh, that we did with the show just to tech, uh, sound, check the sound quality of the show. And it's amazing. I must have had 10 or 12 people on Facebook and texting me that want to be part of Mom's Scrabble game. <laughs> we'll catch up with you a little bit later in the show with your Let's Question It segment and discuss anything that's happening over there in Europe with any breaking news and anything else you could share with us. No problem, Dean. Uh, there's plenty going on. There's plenty to say. Do you want to say anything now? No, I think mine are rather lengthy. If you speak to your mum and just get the thing underway, and I'll go into the segments once we've aired your mum's views and, and what do you want to speak to your mum about, Dean? Okay, Mom. Okay. You, you, were, you were starting to talk about your four other sons. I think before you get into it, I think your... Your story and our story together as a family uh, transcends everything about this show and inspiring people, education, motivation, business, family. You transcend everything about the theme and the topics of this show. And I, I don't know if we could fit it all in, but I think before you get into your four sons specifically, you might want to even go back in time, Mom, and just talk about all the beginnings of, you know, where it all started in Brooklyn and everything, everything that happened. I think what I would like to say right now, uh, during these awful political times and uh, my, uh, my opinion of Trump being such a downer, I am proud to have such a fa beautiful family and I would like to promote love, more love, not hate, to bring this world together. I, That's what made my life so wonderful and so great was all the love we had for each other. What happened to all that love in the world? I think when we get back to Ria's Let's Question It segment uh, later on in the show, I think uh, that plays a part of uh, her question. So we'll, we'll even spend more time on that. But I agree with you, Mom, that with all the bad negative publicity that's happening in the world, domestically and internationally, uh, regarding terrorism and gun violence, uh, everything that's happening with uh, on the political scene, tearing people down, each uh, each politician, uh, it's just awful that it's refreshing to hear what you have to say about family. And this is a that's this, what made my business successful, Dean. It was my family and all the love we had for each other. I don't think we could have been so successful without that. Would you would you mind just sharing for the audience uh, regarding how that all evolved back in 1969 with you and Dad when Twin Laboratories was incorporated, and how it all started and that involvement of family, and over the years? Well, it was uh, it was just a, a dream. Your father and I started our business in our house garage with $20 and it just mushroomed into this 
wonderful business with my five sons being a part of it and grew and grew and grew. It was beyond my expectations. And those early years, how, just so the listening audience could hear it directly from you, how, you know, there's some great stories. I remember dad, um, may he rest in peace, my father, it's been 16 years now. Uh, all this wouldn't be happening to me without my dad and his involvement. Um, but, you know, back in 69, the the business was found. My dad was a pharmaceutical salesman, Mom. You ought to share that story. Yes, he was a pharmaceutical salesman uh, that sold contraceptives. I thought he would lose his job when I had two sets of twins. <laughs> <laughs> but he was he was a wonderful man and a wonderful father. You were very lucky because your father allowed you and your brothers to be in our business and and he he gave you all the reins to make mistakes. He said, how could you learn if you don't make mistakes? And I don't think there are, are many fathers that could do that and uh, allow children to step into his shoes like he did. And I think that's why it, everything was wonderful. When I speak to people, young people, adults, and we talk about our family business, Mom, and how all that started, I, I do give some advice today that I find that children, before they get started in their parents' family business, that it's a good, good idea to maybe go out on your own and do something on your own, like maybe get into sales, get some experience before coming into the family business. How do you feel about that versus... Your five sons came right into the business. Well, we thought that that's what you should do. We tried to encourage you to do that at first. We said the business would always be there for you. But you didn't want to. You wanted to be a part of the business. And I think that was a wonderful thing. I think that was a wonderful thing that you so wanted to be. You had helped us all along the way while you were in college. When you would come home for breaks, you helped us with the business and you got so interested in it that you all wanted to be a part. And as you graduated college, that was your desire. Mom, I still think it's a great story how back uh, back in the early years, I mean, it was unusual for anyone without, back in the early days, without fertility drugs. I mean, to have two sets of twin boys and then a single me. Um, it was a very unusual. And uh, I had a very unusual life. And when I was pregnant with you, Dean, you know that we had this policy with Lloyds of London uh, that I would expect another set of twins. And if I did, I would, uh, for a premium of $1,875, which I didn't put up friends of mine, because I didn't have 18 cents at the time. Uh, friends of mine collected that money and took out the policy from Lloyd's of London, and we received a tremendous amount of publicity. I was in every magazine all over the, and newspaper all over the world. And it was very trying. It was at that time that I learned that I don't ever really want to be famous. It was so difficult. 
when I was pregnant with you because of that. And uh, up till the time that I delivered, and I, uh, and of course I had just one child and not a set of twins, but I was told that daddy was told that he would have been bigger than Papa Dion <laughs> in a twin. <laughs> Uh, but we loved having you single and I, I never really remember raising you. Your four brothers so loved you and took care of you and raised you. I think I was the only mother in the world that used to yell all the time. He's my child. Go without him. Don't. You don't have to drag him around. And they used to say, he's our brother. He's our brother. They were so good to you. Mom, on that topic, I remember one memory as you reflect on that. And I have to put into my brothers, Brian and Neil, that I still remember. They used to take advantage of me. And what they used to do is have me walk four or five blocks from our home, 543 Miller Avenue in Freeport, we loved it those days, Mom, back in Freeport. And they used to make me walk 10 blocks to go buy them devil dogs in those days. And they pay, they would pay, <laughs> they would only pay me a nickel, Mom. What do you think of that? Well, yes. Uh, I remember all those stories. There are some very funny stories. Do you remember going out New Year's Eve with them and girlfriends? They took you. Unbelievable. I remember remember that. Always. Yeah. Great experience. Great experiences. You know, going back to the births, weren't you and Dad before Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show? Weren't you on with Jack Parr twice? Uh, no, with the, the host was Jack Laschooley when I was on The Tonight Show. What was that experience like to be on The Tonight Show? Uh, it was very different to say the least. I was on a few, uh, I was on another show called uh, Stand Up and Be Counted. Uh, I was on a few shows. They, it wasn't great. It was difficult. I, I remember one show being in a little room with a toilet and they gave me a script and I had to stand there and read the script over and over again. It was very difficult. Mom, how did all that evolve? I mean, what was what was the reason that you were and Dad were on the show, and and how did it come about that you were contacted? Well, we had taken out this uh, policy with Lloyd's of London, and. My father had a cousin who was a, a very well-known attorney in Manhattan. And he spoke to him on the phone and he told this cousin what we had done. And the cousin called me up and said he was so impressed with the story. He told his friend who was editor of, um, oh, you caught me off guard and now I don't remember the newspaper. It was one of the very big newspapers at that time. And he relayed the story to him and he was so impressed with the story. He asked me if I would mind if they sent a reporter out to interview me. And I was so young and foolish. I said, oh, I thought that would be wonderful. And they sent a reporter to my house and uh, they came into my house, this reporter, and uh, she asked me some questions. She walked through my house and, and when she left, I said, where should I look for this story if it's in the newspaper? She said, well, if the news isn't great, you may get four lines in the center section. And that was that. 
And the next morning before daddy left for work, because we didn't have phones, cell phones or anything, I, he was in his car, I couldn't reach him. I said, before you come home tonight, stop and buy a newspaper and see if it's in the newspaper. And he left and went to work. And as soon as he left to went, go to work, my doorbell started ringing, my front door, my back door. And the next thing I knew that there were all kinds of newsmen there. They, uh, I was still in my nightgown. I, I didn't know what to do. I was so upset. And they were taking movies and, uh, and that day I was in the newsreel twice. Uh, the six o'clock news and the eleven o'clock news. The the we made front. We were on the front page headlines of that newspaper. Well, I couldn't reach your father, and I your father went. Your father, in the meantime, went to buy a paper, and. Uh, they threw the paper in front of him and he saw these big headlines and everything. And some man said, well, what are you doing here? You better go home to help your wife. They knew that I would be overrun with uh, news people. And so he did. He came home. The story that this woman wrote was so warm <laughs> and she described this young little woman with with these four children and such a clean house. I mean, in those years, I was so particular and so uh, my house had to be so special and so wonderful. And she put this all in the story that everybody edited up. And it went from newspaper to newspaper across the world. That's how it started. And I really became very famous. People recognized me when I walked out on the street. It was, uh, it was upsetting. I started to get fan mail and I got wonderful mail from people who wished me well, and I got awful mail from people who had terrible stories about having twins. And uh, I got one call from, from a, a, a church that wanted me to speak with people there, who a woman who wanted to commit suicide because she was expecting twins. I mean, I had all kinds of experiences with that. And as a result, I was invited to these shows on television. They started calling me up. I, uh, I was invited by, um, oh, no, I forgot the name of the store that invited me to, they would outfit me for all the shows. And they did. They, uh, they gave me clothes and all kinds of things to be on these shows. It was quite an experience, the whole thing. Mom, whenever you come on my show, you never, ever have to apologize to me ever that you are short on memory or collection because besides being the most incredible woman I've ever met in my life, my mother, mm. recently turning 89 years of age, she has the most unbelievable cognitive function that I've ever met for a woman, anyone, anywhere in her age, even women that are 40, 50, 60, for her to go back and talk. I mean, how long ago was that, Mom, with this memory? 
Oh, it's a long time ago, a long time ago, but I'm extremely nervous today and my emotions are so high, Dean, that I really didn't know whether I would even be able to speak. <laughs> so I'm lucky that I'm able to speak for you today. <laughs> So why don't we do this just for just for five seconds, Mom? Let's just take a deep breath. It's you and I. It's as if we're doing a phone call together. I love you dearly, and you're doing great. And just take a deep breath and lighten up, and let's just continue to have fun and talk about history and the family and business and keep keep going on. I know that when you tell this story, I'll let you take a deep breath for a minute. But as I listen to this story that you tell about the bet. I had to live being the baby and being the single son, not a twin. I had to live with for the rest of my life, people saying to me, how do you feel that you were not a twin? And I, I kind of always over the years felt responsible that I, I lost the big bet that was bet on me. Oh, that, uh, I don't, ever let that enter your mind because it was never in my mind to want to be rich. <laughs> uh, money I had, Dean, in my young life, I had everything that money can't buy. So, so who needed money? I mean, I had a wonderful husband. I had marvelous children and we all loved each other. And what more could you ask for a life? I you, mean, money, money is the root of all evil. Mom, <laughs> you, always, you always told your children over the years, always I remember, that the happiest times in your life was were when back, I was poor. When you were poor, yes. and those days we lived in Freeport, Long Island on the South Shore. Dean, nobody believes me, but I think my children and my husband believe me. Nobody believes me when I say that. But well, that's the truth. That's the truth. Money is the root of all evil. I think when me being the single son and when it was time for me to come into the business full time, the summer of 1979, you know, Brian, Neil, Ross, and Steve were all inside in different capacities in the business. That when I got out of school, uh, I was I chose not to go to graduate school to pursue law, and I didn't want to be a accountant or chief financial officer. That I decided to get into sales. You were perfect for that, Dean. I knew that when you were very young. Uh, you were always a people person and I have a story that I remember uh, when you were in high school and it was very difficult for me I used to drive you kids all over but having so many it got very rough and I used to say you you have to find lifts to get you to all your activities and things I can't do so many trips and one day I heard you talking on the phone and you said you were telling this person, meet me at three o'clock. I'll be in such and such a place and uh, I'll be waiting for you. And when you got off the phone, I said, who are you talking to, Dean? You said you were talking to your social studies teacher. <laughs> <laughs> what a funny story, I Mom. That. I couldn't believe that you you had your social studies teacher driving you to activities and things. And that's what you were always able to do because you were definitely a people's person and it, everybody loved you. It was never work for me, Mom. I love, and that's why what I'm doing right now with the radio show, it's a great opportunity to really connect with people like I was doing for all those years when we were in business. That everywhere I go now, I can connect with my radio show in the studio 
outside the studio, I'm going to have a segment called Dean on the Street, where I'll be doing live shows and recording with people, whether it be at restaurants. I know you shared a funny story the other day that happened to you, Mom, about my show by someone that, that lived in your community. I don't Something know. about a wedding? Attending a wedding. Oh, oh, when I was telling this couple of, uh, what you're doing, uh, they said their grandchild was getting married. Would he con consider coming to the wedding and, and doing a show from there? I said, I'll have to ask him. I have no Abs idea. Absolutely. There's no question about it. I've been doing this my whole life. I love to speak to people. I love to connect with people. I'm going to connect with all the guests that we have on the show and my listening audience. I always give, I've always given everybody that I meet, everybody an opportunity to speak to me, always give them a chance. And I just love doing this. Mom, I remember when uh, back in the old days with your celebrity status with the uh, Lloyds of London and everything, was it true? Over the years, the famous, very popular comedian you became friends with, Buddy Hackett? Oh, Buddy Hackett was ver uh, very much a part of my childhood. He was a friend to my brother. Uh, they went to the same school, private school together in Borough Park, Brooklyn. And he, he used to come to my house all the time. And I... I hated them him in those years. I found him uh, so distasteful and so awful as a young child. But when I grew up, I uh, I started to think he was funny, and I enjoyed him in my when I got older. How's Larry, Mom? Larry is great, and he sends his best to you. For those that don't know, Larry is uh, my mom's my significant, significant other. other. Significant other. Great guy. A matter of fact, let's stay on on Larry, Mom. You, I remember over the years, besides attending sports events, as I and and your your children participated in. I don't remember you really being a big sports fan. You know, I remember avidly, Dad religiously growing up on Sundays. Dad was into the New York football giants and I would sit with him every Sunday. We would never miss a giant football game. But I don't remember you being avid a sports fan and watching. But what's happened to my mother over the years, ever since moving to, Del to down to Florida and Larry coming into her life, Larry was a huge NBA fan and my mom is a huge NBA fan and a follower of the Miami Heat. Right, Mom? My second life has been quite different from my first. Uh, with Because of Larry, of course. And I'm grateful for that. The uh, I never gambled in my life. Larry made me a gambler. <laughs> and here at Harbor's Edge, everybody thinks I'm a card shark. I never played cards in my youth, in my younger days. I never did those things. I was strictly business and my children. That was my life then. Now, now I, uh, I have a whole different life. Yes, I'm very into sports and gambling and everything because of Larry. So it makes it interesting. Mom, let's stay on the Miami Heat because it, if I want everybody to know, not only are you a fan, but you and Larry never miss a Miami Heat game. Never. Um, unless, unless it's impossible. Yes, we are very big Miami Heat fans. And we are very sad now because of what happened with Wade. Uh, I don't know what will become of the Heat. But we are truly Heat fans, so I'm sure we're going to continue to follow it and hope for the best. Let me be clear to the audience, Mom, that when you mentioned uh, Wade, my mom, I, Mom, I'd like to have the last two years that you had their star, LeBron James, two years ago. 
He left Miami Heat to go with the world championship, Cleveland Cavaliers. And now you have Dwayne Wade, their franchise marquee player, leaving to go play ball in 2017 with the Chicago Bulls. It's how, two di- how do you two feel about all that? Things. It's two different things. I was very angry with uh, LeBron for what he did. I didn't. What he did in the first place, as a mother, I was. I thought was a good thing. When he came to Miami, and everybody thought it was terrible that he left Cleveland, I didn't. I said if I was his mother. I would have advised him to do that because he was getting nowhere in Cleveland. So I thought that was a good thing. But then when he got somewhere with Miami and they, you know, everything was great. The Miami was so good to him. And then he left. I disliked him for that. Now, when Wade left, it was a whole different thing. Uh, Wade left on good terms, and it's it's an unfortunate thing. There's where money is the root of all evil. I mean, to think that what he was getting, and he's he's old and soon will be over the hill, and to think that it wasn't enough money. He was so special here to everybody in Miami. I it I can't believe that he did that. I can't believe that he did it. But I can't be angry at him because I, I think he's a special kind of person, Dwayne Wade. I don't think LeBron had his qualities. Mom, I think the Miami Heat will move on without both of them. And I think Pat Riley and that organization will survive. And I think the Heat are still going to be a very competitive, great team that you and Larry will continue to watch every every game. Well, Larry always says Pat Riley is a genius. So maybe he'll come up with something. Maybe we could go to a heat game one day, Mom. Oh, I thought thought those days were over for me. We, Larry and I, went to heat games, but it's a bit much for me now to go to Miami and be in those crowds. And uh, it's just uh, too much for me. And I, I think I see it better on the TV. You know, I want to stay on the subject of the NBA, and you might have an opinion on this, Mom, but there was, uh, the other day, there was breaking news from Commissioner Adam Silver that the NBA, the league, objects to uh, the State House Bill 2, which limits anti-discrimination protections for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people in the state of North Carolina. And Commissioner Silver has now pulled the NBA All-Star game out of Charlotte, North Carolina for next year and has to find a new venue. Oh, that's interesting. This topic has become uh, domestic in the USA here. It's become international. It's on every paper about not allowing about discrimination in North Carolina. What's your feelings on this, Mom? Well, you know how open-minded I am, Dean. And um, I'm for everything. Uh, I I don't... uh, I don't believe we should discriminate. I don't believe we should discriminate. People are people. A lot of times that there's going to be some hot subjects that take place uh, on the show. And I want everybody to know that it's going to be a platform where we have single guests on like my mom. You know, Dean, that when we lived in Freeport, Freeport was predominantly black. Yes. And the schools were not integrated. 
And I worked my butt off to get them integrated. I know you did, Mom. You know, you know that. I you know, know that. You know what I experienced on that street when you brought black kids home? I remember those years. They were... I thought I was a terrible person. It was unbelievable. But, but I think that's a part of your goodness, too. You never had a problem with that throughout your life because of how I treated it when you were young. So I would let you bring these kids home. They slept in my house. And and that's all you knew. The other day when and we were... We go back to love again. We go back to love again, Mom. When, when, we, again. when we had you on for a test show the other day, uh, you, you were expressing how busy your schedule is these days. Do you have a... What, give us a feeling of what your typical schedule is in a day. Oh, it's, don't ask how I squeeze. Everybody says to me, why do you have to get up at seven o'clock in the morning? And, and they think it's a joke when I say, if I don't eat breakfast at seven o'clock in the morning, I can't squeeze everything into my day. The, I just have so many things to do. And I don't know what it is. Uh, you know, most of the ladies here sleep till 12 o'clock. I can't do that. I can't do that. Mom, a lot of your friends, a lot of your friends down in your community there are very much like you that have tremendous uh, growth and cognitive function and are very yes. vibrant they were very successful business people and all sorts of way of life can you just comment on the type of community that you live in i find it uh, really re incredible it's absolutely great yes i um uh i you didn't think my children didn't think this was the place for me when i was contemplating coming here i you uh, unlike other children, I mean, most of the people here, I think, are here because their children wanted them to be here. But I'm here because I wanted to be here. My children thought I would be better off in my big, beautiful home with all the help I could get. Uh, that that was the way to go. But I didn't want that for my old age because I, I never wanted to rely on my children to entertain me or take care of me. And I wanted to be with people, not with people taking care of me only, but I wanted to be able to do things. And by moving here, I have a very full life. They uh, have so many activities here that Larry and I do most of them, but there are too many to squeeze in all of them. You just can't. There are things going on every minute here, and I find that great. I find that great. And when I tell people how wonderful they say to me, well, we're not ready yet. And my answer to that is when you're ready, it's too late. I'm so happy that I came here when I was still able to do everything. It's wonderful and marvelous to be able to play Scrabble and Blackjack and and all the things that I do, I mean, there's something here for to interest everybody. And it's absolutely fabulous. Is it perfect? No, nothing is perfect. Nothing is perfect. But, uh, but I'm happy to be here. I'm not sorry I made that decision. And I think all people at a certain age should make the same decision before it's too late. 
That's my advice. Mom, on that note, I think my sister-in-law, Toby, over there in Freehold, New Jersey. Toby, you're going to have to have another drink because after hearing my mom on that, she is remarkable. Incredible at this age to be that type of vibrant life. And that's the type of people that you see in her community. So just remarkable, Mom. We have somebody, I was told, 109 here. <laughs> so I'm just a baby. Mom, we've got to do the Dean Blackman show down at Harbor's Edge. We've got to get down to Delray. You think they'll give me permission to do some shows down there for a week or two? Oh, I think so. I think I've been talking to people about it. I have a, a lady that your brother photographed for his magazine who's 103. <laughs> I said, Sylvia, my husband, my other son is doing a show. Would you like to be on his show? She said, absolutely. Mom, all walks of industries, celebrities, yeah. regular people, people I meet at the car wash, people I meet at Starbucks. Um, Harbor's Edge, doesn't matter what age, I welcome everyone that has a inspiring, inspiring story and life to be on my show. I want to, I want to touch base, mom, before we go across the Atlantic to Rhea, something I'm very, very proud of what you've done as you've, after you retired and as the years went on, your philanthropic work that you've done, I'm extremely proud all my brothers, all your children, all your grandchildren, extremely proud that you still didn't sit still after you retired. And after dad passed on your vision and what you did in philanthropy, that I'm very proud of you that today there's the Gene and David Blackman Cardiovascular Center at NYU Langone in New York that is a state-of-the-art technology in diagnostic heart testing. And you also have the Gene and David Blackman Center for Women's Specialty Care and Preventive Cardiology at Boca Raton Regional Hospital. Excuse me, Dean, I have to interrupt you. At NYU, I recently bought a professorship in cardiology. Wow. That could, I'm very proud of. Could you just share with everybody just how all this evolved? NYU, uh, the chair. Uh, what you did at Boca Regional Hospital. Just just a few minutes on that, Mom. And well, I just decided that life has been very good to me and I would like to give back. And, and why I chose medical, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I... I find it a wonderful thing to give to these hospitals because I am definitely helping lots and lots of people. But I also get something out of it. It makes me a very important person at these hospitals. And although I would like them to be good to everybody, I find I get very good treatment for that. And so it's twofold, my giving. And there are certain things, I'm very selective. I'm very selective. I give to something at NYU that's, well, they call themselves something else now. It's... Um, for children who are deformed. And that's a very important charity to me because there are all these children in this world who are so badly deformed and there's no insurance. They could need 40 operations and it's um, there's no insurance for that. And I think it's pathetic if you can't afford to correct these things on your child and they should have to live their whole life so deformed. It's pathetic. So I give a lot of money there. I think that's an exceptionally good charity for me. And I pick certain 
certain things that are very important to me. The heart, my husband died from heart. And, and so that's important to me. Um, I have different things. I won't give to just anything. And the chair, it's, the fellowship. It's, it's funny. I, um, I, I never give to the Red Cross. And the reason for that is that when your father was in the army, he always told me that the Salvation Army was wonderful to them. The Red Cross was not. So for years, I have been giving to the Salvation Army and not the Red Cross. Those are my reasons for different things. And the fellowship, the chair that you did, Mom? Yes. That yes, the fellowship. Uh, Why don't you explain that a little bit? It's, uh, well, it's a fellowship in cardiology. I have this young this lovely young lady who uh, is a part of my, who has been selected as my fellowship. Wasn't it Dr. And Moore? Dr. Doing, Moore, mom, right? Dr. Moore. She's, she's doing research. And, uh, and every research that she does uh, from now till kingdom come will have my name on it. And I'm very proud of that. You should be. I'm very. I'm very proud of that, Mom. All, all your sons, your whole family's proud. Yes, yes, yes. So, and I plead with my children, please, when I die, carry on. You must give. You must give. Uh, you can't just be takers all your life. You must give. It's very important. Mom, we could spend hours and continue to talk. I see that uh, we need to get over to the over the Atlantic to Europe. Ria Bo is waiting for us to come on uh, from the UK. Ria, are you are you here? Are you there? I am absolutely here, and I'm just loving it and completely touched by what I'm listening to, Mrs. Blackman. What a treat! I had a whole theme and scores and segments all scored out to read over the air to help and educate and things, but nothing I could say really would do as much education as listening to you and spreading the word of love and peace, Mrs. Blackman. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. I love it. I kind of want to move to San Francisco, buy a Volkswagen camp flowers on bread love and peace would you join me yes <laughs> excellent i'm in i'm in i'm there and i think we should hit the parks and give flowers to people and things like that i would love that mom you've spent some time over in london out in out in ria's territory in the uk i love london yes ria what town are you exactly in I am a town, I'm in a town that you're actually in a village, so to give you something a bit more scriptive, I'm up on a hillside, I can see for a long way, maybe 30 kilometres across beautiful English countryside, uh, on the outskirts of a town called Milton Keynes, which is a town and is known for having lots and lots of roundabouts, and a lot of people from older towns don't like it at all because there's nothing old about it. Although there are some beautiful parts that people don't know about Milton Keynes. That is where I am and I'm looking out uh, as I speak to you right now, looking out across all the fields and I can see the cows grazing and the farmers uh, doing all their work in the fields because it's been very dry so they're doing whatever they're doing. So it's all very picture. I'm loving it, Dean. I'm loving listening to you, Mrs. Blackman. And yep. I've... I've screwing up my notes here and just trash that and just listen to you darling to be honest i have a lovely friend from london england who dean you might want her on your show because she's as funny as hell i'd love to have her on the show mom eileen roy i would love to have eileen on 
Kathleen Roulet, she has, I send you all her emails. She's hilarious. Uh, in all the years that I know her, we loved being with her because she was so entertaining. Uh, I'll ask her if she wants to be on your show. <laughs> I would love to have her as a guest. Yeah. I think next we're going to get uh, back over to Rhea in the United Kingdom. I think she's got our Let's Question segment that she wants to have with us, Mom. Okay. Rhea, are you there? Guys, I'm here. I'm gonna. I'm coming off a script, but I'm going to try and blend in with what's going on. I I just feel enlightened for into what's going on, and I was going to go bright and breezy, but I'm going to keep it on a similar theme. Mrs. Blackman, just a question yeah. to you and Dean. Our uh, question of the day, is it we love about days gone by that's been lost today? So that's the question on the Let's Question It part. What do you think it is? What's gone? Uh, you know, it's you're breaking up here on my uh, uh, Skype, and I, I didn't understand your question, Rhea. Okay, I'll try one more time, and then Dean can relay it if it doesn't work. The question is, what is it we love about days gone by that has been lost today? Mom, what is it about days gone by that has been lost today? Oh, I, I don't remember the days gone by ever being anything like today. Uh, everything, uh, was much nicer, and, um, I know you don't, you kids don't believe it, but, uh, just raising children, I was able to send my children out in the street to walk to the park, to go anywhere, Today, if I had a child, I would be afraid to allow them to do anything. You have to worry wherever they go, they're going to get killed or murdered. Or uh, it's a horror today. We didn't. I didn't live in those times. My eighty-nine years were very different than it is today. Mom, Rhea's uh, Let's Question It segment, which she'll always have a Let's Question It segment for every guest on the show. My thoughts on her question, what came to mind for me, uh, camaraderie, closeness of family, uh, respect, yes, and, respect, and, respect and manners. Absolutely. I agree with you on all three. I agree with you. I agree with you. I I have never experienced um, uh, people talking to a president of these United States the way they have the Republicans have spoken to President Obama. I don't care what kind of a president he was or is, but to talk so disrespectful to a president, I find that awful. I agree with you, Mom. I'm not happy about that at all. I feel no, no matter what people's feelings or opinion are of president or policy, the Obamas have held themselves in a high regard, dignity, very, oh, very, a very that. gracious and the children um, the entire family has held themselves with grace and dignity. I don't know how he was be able. I don't know how he was able to do it, to stay so cool with all the things that happened to him. I don't know. Also about the let's question it se segment, uh, the question that Ria threw out, Mom. What also, and Ria is, I remember, I remember things to be simplicity, much more simple. I remember, I remember when we were in Freeport, Mom, and growing up and constantly with my brothers and friends that we would play with a tennis racket out on the street. We would play stickball. We would go to the ballpark. We'd play handball. None of that is happening with children today. They're no, they're all on these stupid uh, phones. I hate the phones.
phones. I hate the cell phones. I mean, that to me was a curse. I I can't stand that whoever I dial on the phone, I I can't speak to a person. It's awful. And all the kids, you just see them with the phones glued to their ears. That's all they know. They don't know how to write or talk or anything. They just are on these phones with the games. And I, I hate the cell phones. Hate the cell phones. Rhea, is there anything else that you want to discuss uh, with my mom before? Yeah, no, there definitely is. And my question is... Mrs. Blackman, what advice would you have for young people just starting out, just left school, and advice on how to put their best foot forward? I would advise any young person to do their best and work hard. They, I don't understand why so many young people think they can come out of school and go to the top right away. You have to work for it. You have to work for it. You can't get things on a silver platter. I think that's great advice. And also with cell phones, picking up on the cell phones topic that you don't like them, I think there should be a list of cell phone ethics of when people should be able to use their cell phone and when they shouldn't. And one of the places they shouldn't is around a dinner table. Oh, absolutely. I agree with you. The dinner table should be a time for talking. The uh, I used to tell my husband when he would be looking for jobs that I didn't want him to take a job ever, that he couldn't be home for dinner because I felt to raise a family, it was very important that he and the children, and I told my children, no matter what activities they did, they had to be home a certain time for dinner so that we could all sit around the table and talk. There is no such thing today. My grandchildren didn't grow up that way, sitting around the dinner table and talking. And I think that's a terrible loss to our good life. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more completely. And before we bring the show to a close, because I think think you've said it all, is I come across a Scrabble word for you, Mrs. Blackman. And the word is qual. Q U O L L. It's a good score, uh, point scoring uh, word. Q U O L L, and it's a small marsupial from Australia. Qual. Q U O. Q U O L L. Qual. Q U O what? Double O, double O, mom. Q U double O. I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you later on, mom. Okay. On that, <laughs> on, okay, on, on that, on that Thank note, you, uh, what? Thank you, Rhea. Mom, what's amazing is You're I'm welcome. I'm I'm in the he- I'm in the studio here in my home in Setauket, Long Island. Still everywhere where I go, all around the world, most people never heard of Setauket. It's about sixty miles east of New York City, you know, in between Nessequag, St. James, Stony Brook, Poquot, Port Jefferson. Beautiful area up here. Uh, where the studio is. And what's amazing is this being our first official launch, the technology has been pretty good, the sound, for us to be able to do a live show here in Long Island in this talk at studio. We've got Rhea in the United Kingdom, and we've got you, Mom, in Delray Beach, Florida. I find it amazing. Okay, good. So on that on that note, I want to thank Mom very much for being part of my show today. I'll never forget it. This is going to be something that uh, for years and years to come that you, your grandchildren, your children, friends, family, all your friends at Harbor's Edge, everyone could hear for many years to come. I want to thank Riabo, the exclusive European correspondent that will always be reporting from, uh, from the United Kingdom, reporting news, breaking news, doing the Let's Question It segment. I want to say to my audience, we want to hear from all my listeners. Listeners can reach out to us with the free text number that's on the website. It's for U.S. residents. 
There's a free text number. Let me say it. It's 631 372 8849. That's 631 372 8849. We'd love to hear from you. Please include your name, your location. We will mention you on all future shows. Don't forget, please like us on Facebook and hit the subscribe button on the show's YouTube channel. If you would like to leave a comment, use the box below. If you would like to share your story, any of your ideas, be a guest on the Dean Blackman Show, just go to the website, deanbleckman.com, and email me. I want to thank you all out there for being with us today. Rhea, again, I want to thank you all the way in the United Kingdom. Mom in Delray Beach, Florida, I'll never forget this, Mom. Please, everybody, listen for the next show on Thursday, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. My special guest will be the author Brian McLaughlin, A Flight Without Wings, My Experience with Heaven, A Journey There and Back. Brian, you'll, if you research, is one of the fastest rising authors right now in the United States. Excited about having him on Thursday. Everybody, please listen in. Have a great rest of the day. Mom, I'll speak to you soon. I love you. Okay, love you too. You've been listening to The Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island, New York. From all of us here, we'd like to thank you for tuning in. We look forward to hearing your comments via Facebook, Twitter, Skype, and email. And don't forget, you can visit the webpage anytime for the up-and-coming guest list. From all of us here... Have a good evening.